Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians is a little book. It's easy to pass by. It's right at the end of your Bible. It's sort of when you start kind of finding uh, town names, you know you're getting close. These would be Paul's letters. He wrote them to Ephesians, to Colossians, to the Corinthians. Just kind of keep going until you find Philippians. Kind of right towards the end. Let's remind ourselves what's going on just briefly. You remember this was a church that Paul had planted uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. We don't know for sure where Paul, wi- Paul was. We know he was in prison, but Paul spent a lot of time in prison. We know for sure that he was in prison in Jerusalem. He was in prison in Caesarea. He was in prison in Philippi. He was in prison in, uh, in Ephesus. He was in prison several times in Rome, so the dude spent a lot of time in prison. So we know he's in prison. I think, personally, I think this is later in his life. The language sounds like this is later in his life in a Roman prison, and he's waiting to die. He very much anticipates that he's going to die. Uh, He loved the Philippians. The Philippians were a congregation that he had planted. They've been supportive. These are his friends. These are people he loves very, very much, and he's writing them. So he's in Rome Uh, maybe in the early to mid-60s. And so this would be when Nero was sort of ramping up um, all of the aggression towards towards Christians and the persecution towards Christians. So so there are marginalized people. They're they're afraid. There's a a very hostile uh, culture against them in northern Greece here in in Philippi. Philippi is a very pro-Roman town. It it would be a a lot of ex-military, kind of a retirement community for for, for. for Roman military. So this is the context that Paul is writing in. He's in jail. Now remember, he's talking, he's doing three things, at least three things, but three primary things. He wants to, he wants to give them an update on what's going on. But one of the unique features of Philippians is even though he's giving an update of his condition, we don't hear much about it. So he doesn't say, hey, the, you know, the food sucks. I don't have any place to sleep. I got beat up yesterday. There's none of that kind of language. It's, it's, he's just sort of saying, here's, you know, here's my, you know, here's, I'm in, pra- I'm in chains. So one of the things that he just got done finishing, so he's going to do that. The second thing is, there's a couple of women that are kind of bickering in the church. I know, how is that even possible? <laughs> it's a couple of gals that are arguing. So, so, the, so he wants to encourage the, the, the community of faith to be peaceful. And then there's increasing aggression against the church. So he wants to encourage them and cast a, a bold vision for them to be humble and to unite together. So these are the things that Paul wants to, to, uh, to, to accomplish in his letter. Um, last week, that these two ideas connect, so I want to remind ourselves what we had kind of studied. Last week, he says, I'm in, I'm in prison, which because of that, people are, are taking it. So some people are preaching the gospel because he's in prison, and they see it as a way of sort of elevating themselves. Oh, now Paul's out of the picture. He was a bum anyways. Now I can preach and make myself famous. Other people are sort of picking up the baton because he can't do it, and they're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up where Paul left off. off. He can't preach, so I'm going to preach. So there's two sides of this vacancy that's sort of left with him being in prison, and he ends the idea by saying, I don't care. For I don't care what motivates a person to preach so long as the gospel is moving forward. This is a big part of Paul's motivation. Throughout the letter, we see over and over and over again, Paul was a man of singular passion. Everything about him was about Jesus Christ, about the gospel of Jesus. He has this singular, compelling mission and vision that he's very, he takes very seriously. So he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about himself. When he does... It's very warm. This particular passage we're going to look at is a guy who's sort of reflecting on, you know, am I going to live? Am I going to die? It's very tender. It's very warm. Um, If you've ever ever had or experienced maybe a a father or a mother that deeply loved Jesus that went on to be the Lord with the Lord and they sort of go through some of this reflection, you've seen it. It can be very, it can be very warm. And this is what's happening with Paul. He's reflecting on his probable death. And uh, so he's finishing one idea. He says, I don't really care what people's motivations are so long as the gospel is, is going forth. So the important thing in verse number 18, he says, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is, is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Continuing on in our text today, he says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. One of the things that comes up again and again in Paul's, in Paul's writings, as well as other New Testament authors, is they sort of saw their life 
in, in, in with an, what's called an eschatological perspective. In other words, they saw themselves, the, the study of eschatology means the study of end days, what happens at the end. So they saw their life as part of the, part of the fulfillment of the kingdom. They didn't sort of see the sort of here's the end of life and then the next life. They kind of saw it as one thing. So when Paul talks about his death, he sees it through the, the lens of eternity, something that we all need to be able to do. And he's able to do this, he says, through through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God changes our perspective. We see things differently. Paul is able to see, so when he talks about his deliverance or his salvation, he's talking about two things. He's talking about, first of all, he very much expects that he's gonna be let out of prison and he's gonna return to the Philippians to continue in ministry. He thinks that's gonna happen. And at the same time, he's, he's living with the possibility that that might not happen. And if that happens, then he's still, his deliverance is still, he's released from this body and he's into the presence of Jesus. So he sort of saw, saw his life kind of with this win-win situation, and, and that's what he's gonna be reflecting, reflecting on, and it's important to us because this is only done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, for some of you who are kind of new to all of this, you might go, man, ah, it's kind of pretty complicated, and it is, but here's what I wanna encourage you. Begin to walk in the deep things of the Spirit. God will bring revelation. God will, God will refocus your life in a, from a different perspective. This is what Paul's, this is why people like Paul who were suffering a lot could reflect in these, in these sort of extraordinary ways, kind of could step out of their current circumstance. He says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit, whatever has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have, su will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul saw his imprisonment like he saw all of his, all of his suffering as a vindication for the gospel of Jesus. So in other words, here's how his, his thinking went. If he was released from prison, if he was found to be guiltless, then the, the gospel is vindicated. Jesus is Lord. He's free to continue to do the work. But if he is found guilty, and even if he's executed, he still saw that as vindication because he said, I'm gonna live my life in such a way that lo the Lord Jesus Christ will still be vindicated and honored in my death. Either way, his life has the singular passion and devotion to Jesus. This is what he lived his life for. And either way, Jesus was gonna be vindicated. Jesus was gonna, vindication means he's proven right. I'm living my life in a way that vindicates Jesus Christ. For, uh, uh, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have suffered uh, sufficient courage, will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For Paul, he didn't see Jesus as the dispenser of good things. Now, Jesus, God gives us good things. James says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. We know that. But the, but the, but the point of our relationship with God, with Jesus, is not to get good stuff, right? In fact, you remember the story where Abraham, to, or God told Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. I'm your reward. When we come to Jesus, Jesus is our reward. There's nothing, that you can't get anything more with it than that. That is our life, that's our reward. Paul understood that. Sometimes we have to change our thinking. We think, well, I, I come to faith, I worship God, I give my tithe, I should be getting some kickbacks here. God is sort of a holy vending machine. that dispens Now, don't get me wrong, God gives us good things. God loves to give us good things. But the point of the relationship is not so we get goodies. The point of the relationship is we get Jesus. That's the point. Paul said, to live is Christ. I already have everything. And even to die is gain. He expresses his theology for, for, for Paul to die means you step into the presence of Jesus. He talks about that throughout his writing. It, I think it's helpful to address here. Sometimes theologians have, have postulated a, a concept called soul sleep, where when you die, you sort of go into a sleep until the resurrection of the body. But Paul really speaks against this here. He says, no, you, you enter into, to, to live is gain. I get Jesus. I'm there with him. I, I have a, I see him in a way that I don't now. Um, it, was, it was really powerful. So he says, either way, whether I live or whether I die, I have Jesus. If I die, I have him even greater. Some of you may be thinking to yourself, well, how do I, I don't, I don't, I haven't experienced that. I don't know what that feeling of Christ alone, having Jesus. And here's what I want to encourage you with. Just keep pressing in. You'll have that feeling. When, 
when, when you learn to worship, if, if, if worship for you is just sort of singing some songs and kind of muttering some prayers and kind of listening to people, then you won't encounter, you won't, you know. But if you, if you learn to walk in the deep things of the Spirit, if you, learn to, if you learn to encounter Jesus through his word, through music, through prayer, through fellowship, through meditation, all the things promised, all the things that are spoken of in his word, then you begin to encounter Jesus. But, but there's still just pieces. We never get, we never get the, full, the, full, uh, the full presence, but we see these little glimpses. And the deeper you walk in the spirit, the more you see them. Then you know what's coming. That's the only way you can say, I don't fear death because I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I've seen him. I know him. I know what's coming. Paul could say that. He says, I've I've experienced Jesus in depth. And when I die, I step into his presence that my whole, everything in me longs for. That's what he's talking about. To die, to live as Christ. All right, if I live, good. But to die, even better. For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor. Here's this part where he sort of begins, he just sort of, this is sort of like an open reflection. If I, if I go on living, that would mean fruitful labor for, for me. What shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with God. He doesn't have a death wish, but this sounds to me like a man who's at the end of his life. He says, I, I, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you all for your progress, for your joy and faith, so that through my being with you and uh, with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account for me. So he, he finally sort of concludes, I'm, I'm convinced I'm gonna live so that I can continue my ministry and partnership with the Philippians. But he says, either way, I'm fine. This, he says, if I'm there with you, it's gonna, it's gonna encourage you to, to boast about Jesus. Christian people, it's interesting that so much of the, of the book of Philippians is about suffering, as most of the Bible is about suffering. But even in spite of our suffering, Christian people should have their heads up a little higher. We should have our chest out a little bit more. We should have a little swagger in our step. Not because of us, but because of our Jesus. We boast the power of Jesus. He says, if I come back to you, it will encourage you to live with even more courage. For whatever happens in verse 27, conduct yourselves in a matter worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then when I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. Now remember, the context of Philippians is there's some internal struggles. But he says, whatever you do, conduct yourself in a way that confirms that you have the unity of spirit. This is a challenge for Christians. Even in in our church, but particularly in every, you know, throughout Christendom, there, there are dozens and maybe hundreds of things we disagree on. Um, you know, we, we got people from every sort of background. We have Pentecostals and Charismatics and Reformed people and Presbyterians and Catholics. And I could go on and on and on. And that's just within the overall arch of Christianity. But then we have people that come to faith outside of Christianity. And so they have kind of their own unique perspectives and people that come from different countries. And so there's all these different perspectives. And what Paul is saying is in light of all of this, in light of all of these perspectives, find unity. He says you have to have unity because there is an increasing opposition to you. You'll never survive it if you don't have unity. Now, if the mandate for us is to be unified in one spirit, that's a challenge, isn't it? You have a couple of options. You can never tackle any controversial issue. That's one option. You say you just never say anything that might make people right, raise an eyebrow at you. And you might, and then might people say, oh, you know, Pastor Jim preaches with such courage. And no, he doesn't. He just says what everybody wants to hear. I don't think that takes courage. It's fun. I, I, much, I like preaching messages I know everybody's going to like. It's the ones I don't think people are going to like to get a little harder. But if you're going to be a church that wants to have a voice in a changing culture, in a changing community, in a changing world, you have to tackle confrontational issues, don't you? And when you tackle confrontational divisive issues, you're going to have people that don't agree with you. That takes courage, in my opinion. 
But at Cross Point Church, one of the things I love about our church, we have every different political thought. We have, we, have, we have people from all different kinds of different political and ideological and sociological persuasions. And we still have to have the courage to talk about controversial issues, don't we? You know what that means? I'm gonna say stuff you don't like sometimes. You still gotta love me, the Bible just said so. So I don't know what to tell you. I'm going to say things that you're not gonna agree with. That's just gonna happen. It's bound to happen. The only way for that to not happen is that we never address anything confrontational or divisive. But it's okay. In fact, I would, I would, I would suggest to you it's good, it's healthy. One of the, I love that I have so many people speaking into my life from every different perspective. It makes me a better human. It makes me a smarter guy. It's really a good thing. That's what Cross Point Church is determined to do. So if you got thin skin, if you get your feelings hurt easy, this is probably not the best place for you. <laughs> there's, there's lots of churches that will always just say nice things to you. But if you, if you really are looking to, to find a church that has a voice that has the courage to tackle complicated, difficult situations, social issues, that's what we do here. We feel like that's our, one, of, one of the things that God has placed us here to do. Paul, whatever the case, call Paul's, call Paul, Paul calls everybody to unity in the spirit. Why? Because the world out there was very much against the Philippians. They were being persecuted. If this is written in the mid-60s, as I believe it is, the, the persecution is ramping up. Pretty soon, Christians are gonna be fed to lions and burned, burned on lampposts throughout the streets. It's horrible, horrible things are gonna begin to happen. And, and so he's saying, you, you're not, you'll never survive it if you don't find unity. Now, we, we sometimes feel like we're persecuted. And, you know, I, I'm... I think at best we can say our feelings are hurt. You know, if a secular organization takes a nativity sound, you know, scene down or they put up holiday trees and Christmas, it's annoying. It's not really persecution, is it? If you, I don't think anybody's holding a gun to your head and say, kneel to Caesar. I don't think that's happening just yet. But the point of it is, if, if we are going to have an impact to a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to Christians, then we have to find unity of the spirit, don't we? We have to find ways of getting along. We have to kind of put aside differences. It's okay to have differences, but we put them aside so that we can be effective in our world. That's what Paul's message is. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy. This, by the way, was one of the common themes all throughout all of his letters to the various cities that he wrote to. I know you will stand firm. I will know that you will stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved, and that by God. Paul's, Paul's writings are sometimes complicated to sort of parse out. He writes in a very sort of lofty language, even in English, it's difficult sometimes to kind of interpret it. And I'm not a linguist, so I kind of, I, 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 I do this work by reading a lot of analysis of the text. And so you have these different ideas, but this, and this is one of those verses that's kind of tough. The idea is not so much that there's, that bad things happen and, they, and you endure and it's a sign to you that you're gonna live and then it's a sign to the bad people that are persecuting you that they're gonna die and they're gonna, you know, all rot in hell. It's not really that, it's more that the persecution then happens, the persecution happens, we have the courage to live it. The sign is connected to the unrighteous people, but the sign is for us. So in other words, we see through our suffering and through our capacity to endure it that God has a plan for us, he has, he's gonna preserve us, and those that don't know him inevitably will have to stand and face God's judgment. So, People who, most people who stand in God's judgment, they don't believe in God, do they? So most people, they, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not frightened of a pending judgment from a God you don't believe in, do you? So the sign is for the people, the sign is for us. So when we, the clear message, not only of this text, but all throughout Philippians is as we endure persecution, as we endure difficult times, hard times, the sign is that God is for us. And for those outside of the covenant, outside of the relationship, the sign is not for them, it's for us. Now that should motivate us then to be uh, ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus because we're the ones that see it. They don't see it, we see it. 
So then we go to be witnesses to them. This is the power of of the, the book of Philippians in the context of suffering. Most people turn to faith in the context of suffering. Sociologists have done a lot of research and people, they they either have a crisis of their own personhood, they have a crisis in their family, they have have some sort of crisis and that's when people begin to see that there's something more. They turn to faith. But they don't see it, the people of God see it, which should motivate us to be ambassadors of Jesus. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer in him, in him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Here, here Paul does something. He, there's sort of a triangulation of the gospel. It's, a, it's an important theme again in a lot of his writings. There's, there's Jesus, there's the Philippians, and then there's Paul. There's, there's, there's this community and there's a bit, and, and, and you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, God didn't call us to follow Christians. He called us to follow Christ. And that's actually not true. God did call us to follow Christians. Paul said over and over and over again, he said, follow me as I follow Jesus. That's always been the model of the gospel. We follow people who are being led by the Spirit of God. And in doing that, then we are being led by the Spirit of God so that other people can follow us. That's always been the flow of human history. So there's this triangulation of the gospel. It's me, it's somebody else, and it's Jesus. There's always that sort of relationship. That's what gives us power. Continuing verse two, he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. What he's doing, he says, if this is you, he's describing a spirit-filled Christian. He says, if you're united with Christ, you have any comfort in his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion. He says, if this is you, then here's how you should behave. As Christians, we spend a lot of time expecting behavior from people that don't know our God, don't don't we? And we get real irritated when they don't act like we do. They don't know our Jesus. So he says, look, if you're not any of these things, if you're not united with Christ, if you don't have any comfort in his love, if you don't don't have any common sharing in the spirit, then just sort of disregard this next section. But if this describes you, then here's your behavior. Make my joy complete. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This, this stabs at the heart of nearly everybody in the West. It just does. It does me too. We're, not, we're, we're, we're sort of raised to sort of be self-interested. We, we tend to pursue our own desires. It's, it's things that make us very strong often, but it's also the, sort of the mentality that makes us ambivalent to a lot of other things. So sort of, this is, a, this is a real conviction for imagine if, imagine this. Imagine if everything in your life, think about just any number of things in your life and weigh them. Are they for your own interest? I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Dang, yes, yes, yes. Seriously, yes, yes, yes. So it's, it, this is tricky. This is a challenge for the Western church. It just is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Esteem others greater than yourself. Yikes. Not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In In other words, imagine if there was this huge shift in who we are as humans, and we began to look through a different lens, the lens of other people. Now, I'm telling you, that's hard. And you might go, no, I do that. Well, go home and reflect, as I have, and you'll find out that most of the things we do in the West are for our own benefit. There's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm saying this is a worldview that's very, very challenging for people with a Western mindset. And this is what Paul is saying. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's a good challenge. We need challenge, don't we? People, everybody needs challenge. I need challenge. You need challenge. This is one of those reminders that says, hey, when you know, you know that thing you do when you're acting in your own interest? You know that thing you do? Stop doing it. Act in somebody else's interest. Most of the problems we have in this life are fixed when we take our eyes off of us and we put our eyes on other people and on Jesus. Most of our problems are fixed that way. We, we, we so often internalize all of the things that's for our, our perspective. And when we switch perspectives, um, most of our problems are solved. Now, Paul's writing all of this. He's encouraging them. Love one another. Be one in spirit. Be humble. 
And then there's, this is the passage that just, it, it just leaps off the page. In your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Christ. And in verse six, is, there's, this, there's this passage. And we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it next week because there's a ton of, excuse me, there's a ton of theology here. And, it's, and it, there's a lot of speculation. Is it, a, is it an existing poem or a song or a hymn that Paul would have already known? It sounds like it is to me, frankly, kind of just reading it in the plain text. It sounds like it was you know, a, a, a song that had already existed that now he's reciting on paper. Paul, though, was certainly capable of lofty language, and he may be writing this. He may have been just sort of swept up in the spirit, and now he's writing this beautiful poetic song. But it's very definitely a poem or a hymn, uh, whether he wrote it or somebody. But he says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, Jesus did not, Jesus didn't, serve himself. He's, now, remember, he's talking about perspectives. He's saying, don't serve your own interests. Serve the interests of other, others. And he's saying, even though Jesus was in, the very, in his very nature God, he didn't use it for his own benefit. Rather, he made himself nothing. Literally, he emptied himself. Not of his deity. He never stopped becoming God, but he emptied himself. Think about what this. He made himself nothing. Think about this for a second. He's in the throne room of God. He's the prince of peace. The son of God, co-equal. Everything, every, everything is his. And in whatever context heaven is, the most lofty things you imagine, he leaves that. Can you imagine what the heavenly beings would have thought? He's doing what now? He's becoming a, wait, a human? You're telling me that Jesus is going to go be a human. Huh. What kind of human is he going to be? He's obviously going to come as a powerful, maybe a, a Caesar. That, that would be okay. If you're going to be a human, be a, be a great human. No, he's he going to be a Jew? This little marginalized community that's kind of scattered all throughout. The Jews weren't a powerful people. He's going to be a Jew? Well, then probably what, in Jerusalem? or No, he's going to come into Bethlehem. Bethlehem, this little hokey pokey town, few kind of maybe a dozen families that live there. That's where he's going to go. How's he going to? Is he going to do they? What? How's he going to be born there? Well, he's going to go to this little podunk inn, which the inns would just be a little kind of a multi-room place, three or four rooms where a person could just sort of communal rooms. They sort of crash for the night. There's not going to be room there, so he's going to go literally be born in a barn. Remember when your mother used to say, hey, were you born in a barn? Yeah, Jesus was, whatever. <laughs> Literally born in a barn. This is what he, he made himself nothing. The, per, the person who spoke with, with, with the Godhood, with the Trinity, spoke the universe into existence, put all of that aside. Not to serve his own interest, but to become as us to enter into our condition. Being found, he said, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And here Paul is very definitely attaching the servant Jesus, the Messiah, to the suffering servant that Isaiah had prophesied about hundreds of years before. He's saying the one that Isaiah prophesied about, that's Jesus. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. He humbled himself. He endured a horrific crucifixion. He didn't need to do it. He said at one point, hey, nobody takes my life. I'm laying it down. He did that. Therefore, because of that, God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, because he humbled himself, God then gave him the name. And when we humble ourselves, we too are given the name because then we're united in it. These are the themes that are spread throughout Philippians, but it becomes so, so real when he's taught. This is what this whole thing of Christmas is about. God becoming flesh 
entering into our world. I imagine if I knew Paul, if I lived in that era, um, I would probably think to myself, dude, you're in prison all the time. It seems like every year you're in another prison. Every time. So if God is so great, how come you're constantly in prison? And probably, knowing me, I would say, dude, I, I can't keep cutting you checks if you're gonna spend all your time in prison. I just can't. You gotta figure this out. And I would probably say to myself, Paul, I think you are kind of chasing, if God is so great, why are you suffering so much? Why are you constantly being beat up? Why are, you, why are you getting shipwrecked all the time? How come you're always in prison? How come you're always getting booted out of town? And people, thousands of people want to see your head on the, on the wall. Why? If Jesus is so awesome, why does that keep happening? And if we sort of think how many of us think, we think to ourselves, God should then be able to take those problems away from Paul, right? After all, he's, he's God. So if God takes our problems away but then doesn't do it, he has the ability but he doesn't do it, then that, you're, that's a pretty crummy God, isn't it? Gods are supposed to fix everything, right? See, here's the issue. Jesus Christ did not come and be with us to take all of our problems away, all of our suffering. He just didn't. He actually did something way more powerful. He entered into our problems. He entered into our suffering. This is why in Matthew, it said that that they'll call him Emmanuel. That is God with us. It's the whole narrative of the Old Testament, the history of the Jews, the temple, the tabernacle, all of the language of scripture, then Jesus himself taking the place of the, the tabernacle was a place where God was among his people. Then the temple was the place where God was among his people. Now Jesus is where God is among his people, living in my heart. It's the whole narrative of scripture, not to take away our problems, but to enter into them. That's what Jesus does. It's hard for us to understand it. Why would, why would God do that? Why doesn't God just take those away? Maybe this helps us understand. You guys have heard the story before, but maybe it helps clarify what God does in these things. When, and I asked Sophie if I could tell the story, and she says that I could, but um, when, when uh, before we came out to the Quad Cities, catastrophic job loss, you know, got fired. The church transitioned me. It just means I got fired. And we were homeless, and so we're living in a little 12 or 14 foot um, RV trailer, trying to figure out our next move. And in that, the kids still had to be, so Phil was 10 and Sophie was 12, and they still had to be in school, they had to go to school. And they, they, they didn't wanna go, they actually called it, they called it the gates of hell. It was this little kind of country school. It was really a nice school, I knew the, I knew the principal. But they had so much pain coming out of their school, having to move from their city, and now kind of going to this temporary school. They just didn't want to do it. It was really painful for them. And, uh, and so they, you know, when going through the doors, they, they, we have to enter through the gates of hell, you know, and um, you did it for two days. Uh, <laughs> but as I'm watching, so there's this one moment where where Sophie is, uh, she's got all of her, you know, we came from the Bay Area, so she's got all of her sort of city clothes on, and this was sort of a country school, and she's got all her nicest clothes on, she's 12 years old, so she's sort of emerging as a young lady, and she wants to be powerful, and she wants to be sharp, and she wants to have it all together. And she knocks on the door, or she, she goes to open the door of the school, and she reaches out, and I had dropped her off. She didn't know, she didn't know I was watching her. I'm kind of back off in my truck, making sure she'll get in there. And she goes to open the door, and she kind of pulls back, and she starts to cry, and she sort of backs down the tears, backs down the tears, gets her courage up, and then she reaches out again to the door to, to open it up. And, and then she kind of pulls back, and she kind of does this, and she's kind of getting her courage. She's starting to cry, and she doesn't want to cry because she doesn't want to walk into a new school with her tears in her eyes. And She reaches out again, and, and she, she tries to go, and she, she backs up again. She does this what seems like forever. My heart is just breaking. It's just the most painful thing I've ever seen. And, and I swoop in with my truck, and I pick her up. I said, let's just go. We'll figure it out later, we, we, and we leave. Probably any father would do it. It was heartbreaking. Any father would do it. 
But Sophie and I have reflected on that moment. And really from a perspective of Sophie's development, it would have been better for her to walk through the door. It would have been. It would have been hard. She probably would have cried. She probably, but she would have seen these people as they were, just people, just kids. Different from us, but just kids. I tried to remove the problem instead of entering into our suffering. If you're raising children, you will never remove all of their suffering. You can't. Amen. What you can do is you can enter into their pain. And in doing that, they learn and they grow and they're strengthened. Right? That's what God does with us. He enters into our pain. And when he enters into our pain, we enter into his pain, his suffering. That's what our union with Christ is all about. In doing that, we learn the person of Jesus in a way that we'll never learn it without. You cannot know Jesus apart from suffering. You just can't. Because suffering reveals the person of Christ. Suffering cleaves our heart in a way that nothing else does. And we're united with him. Maybe this will help us. Hector, can you come up for a second? Come on up here. Let's say Hector and I are good friends. We're both sort of, you know, stunningly handsome middle-aged men. <laughs> and we're going, we're going through life together. Me and my buddy Hector. This is unbelievably awkward, right? Yeah. <laughs> Me and my buddy, we're, we are suffering right now. I can assure you. A great deal of suffering is happening right now. Now, we're going to make it through life. We're going to make it through suffering. You're going to probably raise an eyebrow or two, but we'll make it. Suffering miserably, though, but we'll make it, me and my buddy Hector. Evelyn gets to be Jesus. Let's say Evelyn comes up into our world, into our suffering, and she enters into... Now, this is much better. Let's say Evelyn enters into our suffering and brings some relief. Now, now we're really something now, aren't we? Now, this is power. This is unity. Hector has entered into my suffering. I've entered into his. We've entered into Jesus. Jesus has entered into ours. This is power. This is strength. This is the church. This is the gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You guys got it? That's the power of the church. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Stepping into my pain. Jesus Christ, who didn't have to do it, entering my pain. Not fixing it, not removing it, not just sweeping it away. Entering my pain so that I can know him. Amen. That's why. I don't have to live a life of fear. The Bible never promises a life without regrets. Everybody's got regrets. What it does promise is a life without fear. This is why the angel of the Lord, when he appeared to those shepherds 2,000 years ago, do you remember what he said to them? Fear not. Now part of it is they're big scary angels. These are kind of probably freaky things. There's these guys that are out keeping sheep and all of a sudden there's these massive scary frightening angels. But there's more to that. These shepherds lived in a world of fear, marginalized, hurting, pained people, captive. And the angel says, fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? I bring you glad tidings of great joy because for all people, because today, born in the city of David, this little town, Amen. Jesus came. A savior who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the suffering servant. He came for me. He came for my pain so that I can be like him. That's why I came. Let's be that church that doesn't live in fear, not afraid to suffer, but we enter into the pain of humans our own pain and other people's pain so that we can be the visible, tangible presence of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do and be. 
Fear not. God bless you, Crosspoint Church. Have a great day.